Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first class business location? We are centrally located in Europe and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Ja? No? Forse? Bete dia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting, we love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry guys. Our country is small, but hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? Switzerland is the best location for innovation has stable political, economic, and financial conditions, has the highest living standard, and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
For us in the Aditya Birla Group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Welcome you to Orissa. Come join the Juggernaut.
In healthcare, a vast ecosystem is helping therapy innovators become more patient-centric and more effective than ever before. Cytiva supports researchers, biopharma, and clinicians in the pursuit of more targeted treatments. In discovery, speed and accuracy are everything. The faster and smarter researchers can work, the more patients benefit. To ensure that new, more targeted therapies become reality, we're equipping biomanufacturers with the tools and expertise they need to produce cost-effectively and quickly. How can tens of thousands of individualized patient doses be manufactured quickly, efficiently, and securely? The answer, with a healthy dose of expertise and innovation. We're creating processes and solutions that are scalable and address complex needs. We work to deliver diagnostic tools and other technologies to bring the right therapy to the right patient at the right time so that life-saving medicines come within the reach of more people and could save more lives. Cell culture, protein purification, biomarker imaging and analysis. It may not be what most think about when envisioning the future of healthcare, but this is what we do. Our part in changing the world, advancing and accelerating. Discovery, manufacturing, diagnostics, future therapeutics.
to regulatory compliance is long and filled with choices. With a combination of standards, process, and service, USP can help guide your path to compliant, quality products. Trust the standard that sets the benchmark for medicines. Our robust and collaborative scientific process is part of our comprehensive approach. We offer reference standards that are tied to USP monographs to help you minimize risk and enhance your confidence and compliance, reduce time and resources spent developing in-house standards, and streamline your path to regulatory compliance. We work with independent volunteer scientific experts who rigorously review and approve our standards, which undergo testing by USP and other laboratories around the world. Ongoing testing of our standards helps ensure the quality of your product over time, and only USP reference standards are linked to official USP NF monographs that provide specifications for the identity, purity, and potency to meet FDA requirements without further in-house qualification and the needs of our global customers. With USP, you have access to our in-house scientific experts to guide you every step of the way. In addition to our best-in-class USP reference standards, we offer training, education, and other services. Our online resources help smooth your path to regulatory compliance. Our standards provide precise testing and validation guidelines, as well as reference samples for testing. Drugs can be made consistently every time. We are more than reference standards. We provide a unique combination of standards, process, and service. From buying to applying standards, we support your bottom line with reference standards that have been rated best in class by our customers. Talk with us to find out how we can help you navigate your journey to regulatory compliance. Contact USP at USP.org. Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first-class business location? We are centrally located in Europe, and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Ja? No? Forse? Beci dia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting. We love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays, and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States, and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry, guys. Our country is small. But hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? 
Switzerland is the best location for innovation, has stable political, economic and financial conditions, has the highest living standard and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
for us in the Aditya Birla group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Join the Uh, okay, so, okay, we can start. Okay, uh, good afternoon, good uh, evening, uh, 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 all the participants from, I hope, different parts of the globe. Uh, and uh, thank you all the distinguished panelists and the speakers who are attending today's program. Uh, uh, so we, I will just uh, start this by saying that uh, we all know biopharma is actually evolving uh, at each stage. It was uh, initially purified protein, then recombinant product, then more complex monoclonal antibodies, and today it is having more complicated advanced therapies. So um, it's I think uh, uh, it's the right time that we are having this kind of meeting with our Indian stakeholders. USP for the last two years are conducting panel discussions at uh, different parts of the globe, like US, Europe, Korea, China, 
where do you know the big advance has been made uh, in uh, this area of therapy? Uh, based on the discussions and feedback we received, we are trying to uh, plan how, what USP will do for the standard development and also the training program. So we hope today uh, we'll have a good discussion and we'll get some excellent feedback from you on the challenges what you are facing and the kind of help what you think you require uh, from not only USP in general regulators and other areas. USP uh, FOD will talk about what we are doing in the area of raw materials. Uh, so uh, uh, with this introduction, I will start our first session where we have three presentations. Uh, so first one will be by Dr. Sharma and she's going to give a little overview of the CAR T cell therapy in India and role of government of India. Uh, you know, Dr. Sharma is an advisor of uh, DBT uh, uh, dealing with research and policy issues in the emerging uh, uh, technology of medical biotechnology. She has made significant contribution in translation research on stem cells and regenerative engineering. She has received training at NIH USA. Of course, there is a big CV. So I just thought I will only highlight the key portion. So the, over to you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan, and good evening, everyone here. Dr. Ranjan has already given an overview uh, of the session. I'm going to share my slides. Hope you are able to see. Can you see my slides? No. Can you give her uh, uh, the CIA uh, representative? Can you give her the right for sharing content? So, uh, 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 no, you can please share from yeah, your side. I will, I will, I will do this. Yeah. Very quickly, we are going to share this with all of you. So this session is actually on this uh, CAR T cell technology. So I am going to provide you a very brief overview that what Government of India has done so far and the efforts being made by Government of India, especially by Department of Biotechnology. So my talk will be focused on uh, the efforts being made by the government. So you can just see that uh, the approach is to develop an affordable CAR T cell technology in India. So next please. So as most of you are aware that currently CAR T cell uh, therapy is an emerging treatment for several types of cancers, particularly acute lymphocytic uh, leukemia and uh, also lymphomas. So in CAR T cell therapy, the patient's own T cell are uh, being modified to make them identify and attack cancer cells and any other specified target. So keeping in view the benefits, it has been felt that this is very important that this technology should also be brought to our country. And however, major challenges associated with this technology include that this is quite expensive and therefore this makes it unaffordable for most patients, not only in India, but worldwide also. Some side effects have also been reported, such as cytokine release syndrome and non-specific toxicity. And there's a lack of availability of clinical grade vectors and also difficulty in expansion and scaling of ingenious immune cells. So uh, next, please. You can see that CAR T cell therapies, which have been approved by US FDA, and these are two, and the details are available on uh, in the literature and that uh, this is Kimra and yes, Carta, and that this uh, you can see that where this can be used and also in this slide you can see that overall states involved in CAR T cell therapy how uh, the uh, patients on uh, cells now the peripheral bone marrow blood mononuclear cells are being converted and with the help of vector and all it is being re-injected into the patient. So next please. Keeping in view the potential therapeutic applications of this technology, an initiative has been taken by DBT along with BIREC. And my colleague, Dr. Madhavi, is here from BIREC. It is a PSU of Department of Biotechnology to develop CAR T cell technology at an affordable price in the country. So, in order to discuss the current status and strategy for development of this technology in the country, a brainstorming session was organized with all the stakeholders, including academia, industry, and the medical fraternity to identify the challenges in the field and also the what is the way forward. And uh, some of the experts here, uh, are, uh, they were the part of this brainstorming session. 
and the group felt that there is an urgent need to encourage the development of car constructs and clinical grade vectors in india it was also felt that the indigenous methods for large scale manufacturing of car t cells needs to be developed since it is a major bottleneck in implementation and also innovations are required to bring down the cost of treatment and reduce the side effects next please based on these recommendations and also uh, extensive consultation and advertisement was formulated to invite proposals so a number of concept proposals were received which were then subjected to multiple level of screening by the committees of expert in the field and out of these a number of proposals recommended for support are now under implementation next please the proposals which are under consideration cover a range of objectives including development of car t cell technology for specific diseases strategies for large scale production following good manufacturing practices and novel approaches to increase safety and specificity of the treatment these proposals focus on variety of diseases including blood cancers such as acute lymphocytic leukemia and multiple myeloma solid tumors such as that hepatocellular carcinoma and glioblastoma and even as an approach using car with regulatory t cells for treatment of type 1 diabetes approaches have also been included for reducing the side effects and cost of treatment so with researchers and institutions working in close collaborations with highly focused objectives it is hoped that the groups involved in development of car t cell technology in the country will be able to take the leads forward in a timely manner so with this i would like to now conclude my talk um, with this overview and i have to now as i mentioned that uh, dr madhvi will be uh, there to uh, tell you about some of the activities which has been taken with the industry and uh, uh, to take this forward uh, has been taken by bayre and uh, now with this uh, uh, i uh, i will now would like to thank you each one of you and i really uh, it, it was my pleasure to be a part of this session and i am ready to uh, from the government of india i am assuring you that we are ready to take the recommendations of this session forward to the next level and also will try to work together as a team to bring this technology to the country thank you and over to anu thank you i think dr sharma uh, so um, uh, we will move to our next speaker Uh, the topic is overcoming CMC challenges in CAR T cell therapy. Uh, was given by Dr. Bruce Levin. He is the professor in cancer gene therapy, founding director of the clinical cell and vaccine production facility at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, he is the co-inventor of the first FDA-approved gene therapy chimeric antigen receptor T cells for leukemia and lymphoma licensed to nobodies. Uh, so we have uh, really an expert in this field today to share his thoughts with us uh, and he has received several awards and serves as the president of international society of cell and gene therapy uh, i mean he's a illustrious career so i don't want to go through the detail of his cv uh, with this short introduction uh, let me hand over to bruce for his talk yeah thank you very much and Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak to you today. I have a number of slides to go through, uh, and uh, let's see if we can get those up. If not, I'll be able to share my screen and uh, speak with you. So I'm going to um, uh, talk about some CMC challenges. I have some disclosures that you'll see because I have a financial interest in um, due to intellectual property and the field of cell and gene therapy. Uh, most relevant to today, I'm on the scientific advisory board of Immunil. Uh, that conflicts are managed in accordance with University of Pennsylvania policy and oversight. Um, so I know, shall I share my slide or uh, would you like me to share? Yeah, I mean, if that's more comfortable to you, so you please share your screen, otherwise I can take it forward. Okay. Do this and... Uh... Yeah, I think it's coming. 
Can you see it now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll get it into presentation mode. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'll start on how to make a card T cell product, uh, talk uh, briefly about the raw material, uh, about product testing and critical path issues for adoption. So you saw some version of this uh, just earlier. I, I want to make the point uh, that uh, we're generating the cells that we obtain from the patient and we can enrich or isolate. We use a viral vector to deliver the genetic material encoding the car. Uh, we use an artificial dendritic cell to stimulate. The T cells grow up in a bioreactor and then we concentrate and wash, remove quality control samples to address FDA criteria for safety, purity, potency, and identity of the cell product. And then we formulate, cryopreserve, uh, perform the test and release. So how do we think about manufacturing drugs from a patient? Uh, well, when you think about T cells, what's been discovered over the past several decades is not all T cells are created equal. And this is a figure uh, in a paper from Luca Gattinoni. Uh, the earliest uh, cells, uh, T cells are so-called stem cell memory, and then central memory and effector memory. And as you go from left to right, you have uh, decreasing therapeutic efficacy and self renewal uh, but you have increased effective function. So it's really striking a balance on what flavor T cell is best. And how do you define what is best? Those are rough phenotypes. Uh, we're dealing with patients, they vary. Uh, should you select, should you deplete? How do you know that you always have the right cell? Are you chasing rainbows? Uh, and when we think about raw material, uh, I'm an advocate of depleting the bad cells rather than uh, thinking that we can select uh, always the right cells. In scaling up and doing validations, it's extremely important to remember that healthy donor cells do not behave like patient cells. And it's really critical, critical get your hands on uh, patient cells. Okay, so what contaminants can there be? I won't go through all of this in detail. Uh, there are granulocytes, platelets, blast, uh, leukemic blast, monocytes, myeloid derived suppressor cells, and NK cells. Uh, again, a, a great mix uh, that you're collecting. So, how do you define what raw material is acceptable? Well, it varies. Uh, look here on the left, you see the percentage of CD3 cells. In the blue are successful manufacturers and the red are, are manufacturing failures. The same holds for lymphocyte fraction and for monocytes, lower monocytes are better, but you see a substantial degree of overlap here. And there are some that if you set a limit of 20 here, you could get a successful manufacturer. And so how do we deal with this variability? Well, we have conditional manufacturing pathways or implement T cell selection. Now, coming back to the phenotype of the cells, uh, the terminal effector cells, uh, when we do test expansions, we have failures to expand in products that have a higher percentage of this so-called terminal effector phenotype. And in another trial, the starting uh, material quality was found to be important, confirming uh, that the frequency of CD8 positive, LAG3 positive, TNF low was associated with inferior clinical activity. So if you start with more exhausted cells, you get more exhausted cells in the patients. And here's the reference to this paper at the bottom. Let's talk about the timing of cell collection and treating these cancer patients. Uh, most of the patients that are receiving CAR T cell therapy are relapsed refractory. They've undergone many rounds of chemotherapy and immune therapy, biotherapy, 
And with increasing rounds of therapy, as you can see here for ALL on the top, lymphoma, and then some solid tumors down here, the gray is the terminal effector. So the cells that we're collecting from patients that are currently eligible are pretty beat up. And here's an example of an apheresis that was done and we collected at a, a low lymphocyte count and failure to expand. So then that patient received some additional therapy, cyclophosphamide and autologous stem cell transplant. We collected again with a higher lymphocyte count and this time a manufacturing success. Uh, just a short word about qualifying ancillary materials, viral vector, we test for adventitious agents, replication dominant virus, residuals, the multiplicity of infection to qualify the lot. Media and serum, we do test expansions and we measure cell size and viability. And then the beads that we use to st stimulate cells, good with anti-CD3 and anti-CD28 antibodies, We'll also look at expansion size and viability. So let's talk about testing. Uh, and we test the collected product. Uh, we don't generally qualify the collected apheresis. We do have guidelines for ab absolute lymphocyte count. However, we do in process testing. And then the final, uh, final formulation uh, here you can see is all our release criteria. Uh, and we can discuss this in detail uh, during the uh, discussion period. Well, let's talk about a couple of those, viability. Uh, how low can a viability release criteria be? Well, we set it at 70% in the commercial products it was set at 80%. So we went to look at, does that matter? and here is a report that was in blood, and it doesn't matter if it's above 80 or below 80 in this cohort in acute lymphoid leukemia and in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. In fact, we released uh, some cells based on exceptional uh, release, and here's one that is below 60% viability, and still the patient had a complete response. Now, this is a very difficult concept in traditional biologics and pharmacology. This is a dividing drug. Does CAR T cell dose matter? Well, here's a cohort of chronic lymphoid leukemia patients. This is looking at the in vivo expansion, complete responders, partial responders, non responders. And so you can see that the area under the curve here roughly correlates with the clinical response. Uh, the dose does not correlate with clinical response in this cohort. Here is looking again at the maximum concentration and the weight adjusted dose. There's no correlation in two clinical trials um, of pediatric acute lymphoid leukemia. So, we examined this maximum concentration and the area under the curve, and then made correlations in pediatric acute lymphoid leukemia, adult acute lymphoid leukemia, and chronic lymphoid leukemia. And now you see there is a statistically uh, significant relationship here with area under the curve and the maximum concentration, but there's overlap. So what does that tell you? It tells you that there are other factors at play. Phenotypically, if you look at the final product, we can correlate clinical response with the expression of checkpoint receptors. So higher expression of checkpoint re uh, receptors indicates a non-responders, but, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, still, you see there's significant amount of overlap here. We're getting better at phenotyping. Uh, this is looking at uh, uh, 40 markers and 16 clusters. This is a phenograph. Uh, this is not me. Uh, this is uh, someone unrelated to me, but using this high definition phenotyping, we can gain more information. So what are some critical path issues looking uh, very broadly? Uh, this is a complex drug to manufacture. Uh, to decrease uh, cost, we need to implement automation and shorten the culture, and we're doing that. We need to work on enhancing potency, 
especially for solid tumors by integrating armor switches and combinations. We need to have education and training uh, because companies and academic centers are hiring at tremendous rates. Uh, as mentioned up front, I'm president of the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy. Uh, I urge you to take a look at our society and to join. Uh, and finally, uh, financial complexity. We can implement predictive biomarkers uh, to give us a sense of whether a patient is likely to respond. And we also need to look at value-based uh, payment uh, that links price to outcome. So I'm a representative of a very large group of people at the University of Pennsylvania, Penn Medicine, Children's Hospital, I'd like to recognize uh, that our early studies were supported by philanthropy and then by industry. Uh, and we have worked very closely with collaborators at the US Food and Drug Administration and owe a great debt to our patients who volunteer for our clinical trials. You can find me on Twitter at BLLPHD. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the names are not enough here. It, it truly does take a village. There are hundreds and thousands of people that contribute uh, to these studies. So uh, I thank you uh, for your attention and I will uh, uh, stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Bruce, for this excellent presentation. So we'll take it forward during our panel discussion. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Fouad Atto. Uh, he's going to talk about the overview of public standards to support quality product development uh, uh, Fouad is the head of global biologics at USP. He leads all scientific activities related to develop and maintenance of documentary and reference standards for biologics and antibiotics and oversee the bio labs at USP US and in India. Fouad has his PhD in cell biology in uh, Pierre and Marie Curie University at Paris, France. He worked on cell-based therapies for diabetes at NIH USA. So you can see he is coming with a background of cell therapy. So today he is going to share our USP's work. Over to you, Fouad. Please uh, give him access for sharing content. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjan. Uh, I think I'm, my slides are already on the screen. Can somebody just confirm? You can see, you can hear me, you can see the slide? Yeah. It's yes, Fouad, yeah. Okay, all right. So um, at USP, we've been building trust for the last 200 years um, through our work um, supporting public health by disseminating uh, standards that support quality of pharmaceutical product. And obviously, we evolved over time to support biopharmaceutical. And in uh, the last decades, uh, some of the work we've done on cell and gene therapy also in, in support of that. Um, I want to also share maybe um, something about our um, strategic approach to biologics in general, including uh, cell gene and tissue therapies. Um, the standard setting focuses today on the overall product life cycle, not just at the release of uh, time of product. Uh, we, we develop standards uh, by engaging stakeholders early on and uh, work with them to identify um, problems and, 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 and also work together on uh, developing those solutions. Some of the solutions we, we provide uh, focus on uh, developing analytical tools, performance standards that support uh, enabling and demonstrating uh, performance of assays, of processes, and, and we do the work in alignment with global norms and standards. Part of that approach to performance standard and rather than focusing on just the product, but rather the, the performance of the assay and the process, we, we uh, spend a lot of time working on raw materials and we have a number of standards to support and, and best practices to support qualification of raw materials used in uh, biomanufacturing, including some of the ancillary materials that Bruce mentioned. Um, Part of our strategy also in recent years is to dedicate um, time and resources to supporting emerging therapies, such as the, the CAR-T product we're discussing today, and other therapies that may be based on novel technologies. Um, this is just like a list maybe of examples of standards that already exist in USP, just to give you maybe a flavor of uh, how we tackled um, this, um, this area. 
from best practices on cell gene to some of the ancillary material standards, but also um, a flow cytometry standards to support enumeration for CD34, for example. But as, as an example, we are looking also at other um, standards uh, using flow cytometry um, for counting different uh, cell types. Um, as we advance, uh, we work actually closely with stakeholders, as I said earlier, in uh, the form of roundtables, expert committee, but also workshops. As a result of uh, those discussions over the past few years, we identified uh, a number of standards to be developed for like the, the, the areas that where you have unmet needs from an analytical standpoint. What you see here on this slide are just like snapshot and examples of the standards that we are looking at and uh, bucketed into three areas, product characterization and analytical testing. And, and there you have characterization and cell counting. Uh, but also um, the, the, the vector genome titer for um, AAV and the issue of empty full, um, you know, capsid ratio. Uh, an area relevant to the discussion today is uh, how you measure um, the, the, the integrated lentiviral vector uh, into the genome once you transduce the cells. And we're doing some work actually to develop a standard for uh, how to measure vector copy number. Uh, testing of impurities and residuals is really critical the same way it is for other um, biopharmaceuticals. And then in general, like raw materials, and I think we can go through just like if you look at the slides that Bruce presented, you can see the large amount of materials, but also the variability and the need to have best practices and uh, sometimes reference material that can support the, the testing and qualification of some of those materials. And that depends on the, on the criticality. And obviously some of the examples um, here, like the, the, the viral vectors, but also cell culture supplement, plasmid DNA enzymes. Another area of interest that we will not cover today is the rapid microbial method and applications to advanced therapies. So I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, just on the vector copy number as one example of the type of standards that we are developing. We're looking at uh, developing procedures and methods, but in parallel, what the driver is is really having a reference standard based on a genomic DNA from cells, cells that contain defined numbers of lentiviral vector genomes per cell equivalent. And the intended use of the standard uh, from the user standpoint is to calibrate uh, vector copy number assays as well as uh, processes for transduction. Uh, this uh, standard will be complementary to uh, the new WHO and IBSC lentiviral vector copy number standard, which is available actually right now. Um, and the, the, the way we are planning to conduct, so this material is being prepared and we plan to um, run a collaborative study and test the material using uh, different methods like qPCR, digital PCR, and sequencer for integration uh, site analysis. What we intend to provide is a panel of reference standards candidate uh, material uh, that is currently under development, and the panel will contain genomic DNA from cells with different levels of integrated provirus per cell. Uh, right now, we're looking at low, medium, high, and probably one to five, because we know I think that five is the, the cutoff, is the, the, the limit actually of how uh, much the maximum of um, vector copy integrated in a genome. So I think this is an um, exciting time for USP and for the community, and uh, we'll would be happy to share more actually in the coming months here actually as we connect on progress for that project. So uh, I want to conclude by just recognizing that the complexity and the variability of advanced therapies uh, present challenges to standardization. This is not an easy task, but we choose to focus on uh, a few of the until methods that support the quality control of raw material uh, component uh, that are um, important for um, consistent manufacturing. We also look at um, you know, control of procedures and analytical method to reduce the non-biological sources of variability. We're committed to working with uh, different stakeholders to expedite the development of this type of medicines. And you can find more information on our website listed here. I think with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Fouad. So I think we have some excellent themes which has come up uh, during all the three talks, and then we can take it forward for the uh, panel discussion.
So I will hand it over to Naren, uh, Dr. Naren Chirmule. He is the CEO of Symphony Tech Biologics. He has PhD in Applied Biology from University of Mumbai. And uh, he has experience in development of biologics and vaccines, immunopharmacology, and of course, public speaking. Uh, he has hold position in Cornell, UPenn, Mark, Amgen, and the last one was in Biocon. Uh, so I will hand it over to you, Noreen, to take us through the panel discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you. It, it's great to see everyone in one um, screen, you know, all of, all of us who are deeply interested in CAR T cells. Um, so the way the panel discussion is, and um, Anu or uh, Ranjan, we have 45 minutes, is that correct? Uh, or an hour? I think about an hour. One full hour. Yeah. Yeah, so we have an hour. Good. So we will we'll discuss all the questions. Um, I have a I have a series of questions that I will ask, but what I will do is let's have a discussion, and then we can go around the room asking each other questions. So let's start with uh, so just sort of opening statements, um, and I'll request Rahul to start, uh, or maybe uh, so first Gaurav to start, then Rahul, uh, Sharad, uh, and then Shashwati. Then just maybe three minutes of your first opening sentences, and then we can open it up for discussion. So Gaurav, please go ahead. Hi, hello. Good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot, Narayan, for you know for getting all this together because the time has really come for us to be discussing Karti in India. Uh, we are very, very excited uh, for, about uh, you know all this that has been going on. Uh, as uh, this so, space around 2015, uh, when Rahul and I got together, and uh, we were already working independently on this, and we got together, and uh, we have recently been able to develop. Uh, an indigenous CAR T product in Rahul's, uh, uh, you know, lab, and uh, uh, we hope uh, to be getting on to clinical trial uh, this uh, this year. And we are also expecting that there should be many more, probably, clinical trials starting across the country in you know 21. So it's a very exciting time in India. We are very happy to be in this. Uh, there is uh, some issues which we would like to bring out during this discussion. Uh, and uh, I will take the cue from you when you know you would like to bring something in. Uh, otherwise, uh... yeah, yeah. J just quick introductions. Rahul, please uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone, and thanks. Uh, hi, Bruce, and hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Narain, for having me here. And uh, so we are working on the Star T cell platform development uh, and. Uh, is starting with the anti-CD19 car in India from last almost over six years. And we have got some success, but it's still a long road to go because we have to still test our construct in the clinic. And hopefully we are uh, uh, going to check uh, the whether our construct, how it performs in the clinic. And uh, we are excited uh, to Thank you. I think you broke up a little bit. Um, Sharat, uh, maybe while you can quickly introduce yourself and then we can start. Yeah, I'm Dr. Sharat Damodar. Uh, I'm a hardcore clinician, basically a hemato-oncologist and a transplant physician. So primarily dealing with patients. So I will tell you the patient side of things, uh, which is of interest. So clearly, uh, you can see the progress in our country uh, in, in treating a lot of oncology from chemotherapy to stem cell transplant. There are close to about 100 stem cell transplants in the country now. So a lot of progress in that area. So clearly, the next step forward is everybody talks when you have a relapsed disease or a refractory disease, when is CAR-T coming to India? Because patients are very knowledgeable and they would certainly come and ask you, why can't we access this therapy in our country? And this is an absolute need. And clearly, I will answer this later when I get questions on the actual diseases. But clearly, leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, clearly numbers are huge in our country. And there are a huge number of patients who are requesting for this. So people are eagerly looking forward to accessing this therapy in our country at an affordable price for sure. You know, we have to bring in that factor. I think that's why it's very important to have this, this discussion and among ourselves and get encourage, encouragement from the government bodies to actually get this going in our country. Great. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, and Shashwati, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself and then we'll get to the questions. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Naren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Shashwati Basak and I'm heading the quality and uh, regulatory operations at Immunity Therapeutics Limited. It's a startup company. It was founded uh, in uh, December 2018 and operations began in June 2019. So we are uh, very, very new in operations right now. We have our facilities ready and we are looking forward to taking forward one of the uh, in-licensed CAR-T product that uh, we have gotten from our partner in Spain, which is already clinically tested uh, in a phase one trial. And uh, we are hoping that we can, you know, cover the regulatory path here in India to get to the patients as quickly as possible. And Dr. Sharat here is actually one of our collaborators uh, in this process. Uh, Bruce Narain, I mean, uh, those are familiar faces. And in fact, I'm learning from the masters in this field. So uh, my focus here in today's panel discussion would of course be on the regulatory path and uh, how uh, along with the regulators of Indian government, we can uh, you know, uh, make it a little bit tailor-made for a personalized therapy or an autologous therapy like CAR-T wherein many of the other regulations may not be applicable. So I'm really, really looking forward that uh, some of the messengers here from the government side can take our message back to the Indian government and uh, make our path a little bit easy and uh, you know not get uh, uh, sidetracked by some of the things that are required in biologics or vaccines or small molecules because this is a living drug as Bruce very rightly mentioned and we have to you know uh, acknowledge that part and of course the second part of it that I would like to focus is the quality like how the product is made and how it will be administered, keeping the safety, purity, uh, potency, and uh, uh, the identity of the product in mind. So many of the assays that Fauth already described, uh, I would actually look forward to uh, Fauth in helping us develop some of the reference standards that we find challenging. For example, in potency assay, there is no, um, for example, reference standard or any kind of a cutoff value which is globally accepted and uh, and can be administered to a therapy like CAR-T therapy. So, so thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Dr. Naren, you are on mute. Um, sorry about that. Um, so first, first we'll spend a little bit of time understanding the magnitude of the problem in India. Problem meaning the clinical patients and all that. And I'll ask Sharath and Gaurav to expand on that. Then we'll talk. I, I'd really like to talk about what, why is is there are only three companies in India and thousand companies in the rest of the world. I mean, I want to understand that. Maybe some explanation for that. And then we'll get into the raw materials and and discuss some of that. So maybe 10, 10 minutes, ten minutes, ten minutes, and then we'll do open Q and A. So let's start with maybe Sharad and Gaurav. Maybe you can maybe we can start with Sharad and then Gaurav. Talk to us about about the magnitude of the problem. The echo I'm getting. But Sharad, go ahead. Yeah, maybe I'll just start. Uh, I, I did mention, you know, three specific diseases which uh, currently we're looking at and where the data also exists. So clearly acute lymphatic leukemia, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and myeloma. Uh, these are the three areas where we feel there is certainly a need. And the reason is this. So even if you look at pediatric ALL, where you have the highest cure rates, if you look at Western data, the, the recent uh, updates are cure rates of in the range of 90 to 95%. That's not the reality in our country, where even from the best of institutions, the academic institutions, the cure rates realistically are in the 60 to 70% uh, range, which is the published data. There may be some differences between center, but that's reality. So you have clearly about close to 20-30% of relapsed uh, leukemia, where currently we are taking them for an allogenic stem cell transplant, where again in relapsed leukemia, the cure rates are in the 30-40% range. You know, this is uh, our national data. So clearly we want to look something beyond that or maybe a bridge in people who don't go into remission. So that's the need in uh, ALL. Uh, and this is just the pediatric ALL where we actually talk about higher cure rates. In adult ALL, it's even lower down, where the upfront cure rates itself are in the 40-50% range. So your higher subset of patients potentially for any of these 
therapies. We also have to bring in the, the impact of comorbidities in adults. And clearly, you know, it's not something easily done when you have to pull somebody through an allogenic transplant, even though you've got reduced intensity conditioning regimens nowadays. But clearly, we have to balance out the comorbidity in the older people. So that's for acute lymphatic leukemia, just to give you a little flavor of that. Lymphomas are another subset. Uh, if we just uh, divide them into B and T cells, about 80-85% are B cell lymphomas, in which the diffuse large B cell is a big subset, majority of it. Even with whatever chemotherapy, the standard arch or anything beyond that, we have about 50-60% cure rates. The ones who relapse, you do an autologous transplant, 30-40% cure rates. And after that, if you want to take somebody and they're relatively fit, they're not so sick in a relapsed lymphoma setting, if you're going to take that person for an allogenic transplant, the morbidity is pretty bad and even the mortality rates are higher. And there's still debate about the graft versus lymphoma effect in a lymphoma compared to a leukemia. So clearly another big need which comes up there and we have patients asking for it. So that's that's the reality of, of the day. And the last subset is myeloma. We always talk of myeloma as a disease of the elderly. We commonly see patients in the 40s in our country coming with myeloma. So currently we are not talking cure in myeloma. So how do you tell a person in his 40s with myeloma saying that I can probably control your disease for maybe 10-15 years and after that it's trouble. So clearly... Even with whatever newer drugs, the bispecific antibodies, the autologous transplant, once you go beyond that and if you're trying to hit allogenic transplant in myeloma, again, outcomes are very dismal. So clearly, we want to look at this newer therapy. And uh, recently, I saw something uh, published uh, data from China where they've just decided upfront that with the autologous transplant, if they piggyback a CAR T, uh, as upfront therapy, their you know, results of MRD negativity in myeloma are close to 90 to 100%. 100% which is very good, you know, because when you talk MRD negativity, you're start, I mean, starting to talk about cure rates in some of these disease subsets. So that's just putting a few of these things, which is the need of our country at this point in time. Let me pause here and, and see if the panel has any follow-up questions for Sharath at this time. So Sharath, are there any data for the numbers of patients of ALL or DLBCL in India? The like frequency, what is the frequency and what are the numbers? Yeah, so there's very sketchy data, Rahul. Actually, you know, the National Cancer Registry is now actually collating that data and put it together. A lot of data initially was published from uh, Tata and, uh, you know, Velour and some of the bigger centers. So that data is being collated and uh, roughly, you know, uh, from whatever, you know, sketchy data there is, there are close to about, I think, uh, nine to 10,000 uh, patients um, with ALL who are you know, at least going through some of the initial chemotherapy. A lot of them, you know, give up halfway through. Then you look at that subset. So we just recently looked at some of this data to look at what would be the subset who would be eligible for a CAR T. And you may still have close to about 3,000 to 4,000 patients, you know, uh, at least on a yearly basis. And this is a number which is not very reliable. I mean, the least kind of data number we can look at. Right. So uh, we know uh, from the data, like overall data is sketchy. And Tata center data, what we know about uh, from our center, how is the experience at your center, like in terms of the this uh, response uh, for, from the chemotherapy or durable response from chemo as well as what are the numbers at your center because that's how in india we can calculate a good uh, numbers right right so if i i will start from the top and come down so you know since we are a big uh, referral center for transplant we do close to about uh, 150 to about 200 transplants a year uh, of which about 70 to 80 percent is the allogenic and in that subset, if I look at it, about 20-25% is for thalassemia, another 25% is for acute myeloid leukemia, and about 10-15% of that number is for relapsed uh, ALL. Uh, so this is out of a base of about, say, uh, if you look at about 10-15 to 15 patients who are coming in for a potential transplant from a base of about uh, 90 to 100 patients in a year who have gone through the entire protocol of treatment and then have relapsed and thereby coming up for treatment. Uh, there will still be a lot of outliers, patients who come in, then cannot afford breakaway in between because of compliance issues or move to another center or switch to other modalities of therapy, which is, which is all there, which doesn't get captured. So this is from one center where you know, this is the current load which we see. 
and if you look at our own pediatric and the adult ALL data, this is the numbers which I actually put across. You're looking at about 70% cure rates in the upfront, the standard BFM protocol, and about 50% in adults, you know, using the same protocol. So we still have that chunk, which is close to about 40 to 50% of patients who need subsequent therapy, which could be an allotransplant or, or something else. Right. So, so if I can, uh, sorry, interrupt, uh, just Bruce, um, from your perspective, just as a comparator, um, what are the approximate numbers in Penn or in US? So when you mean in terms of transplants or CAR T no, or companies? No, no, the leukemia, then maybe um, transplants and then maybe CAR T in that. So just as a comparator. Yeah. So the, um, uh, the ALL uh, is a in the seven to 10,000 range and CLL and myeloma is more and lymphoma is in the 30 to 40,000 range, as I recall. Uh, you have to understand I'm a PhD, so I'm going off uh, what I overhear from the MDs. Uh, but uh, uh, look, there are now actually four approved CAR T cell products. So we have Cambria in pediatric ALL and lymphoma. We have um, the uh, Yescarda in lymphoma. We have uh, the Tacardus in mantle cell and the most recent one, Brianzi in lymphoma. And I, I believe there's gonna be an approval this year, if, if not uh, early next year in myeloma for a BCMA product. So these CAR T cell products are here to stay, and it, it's um, how we develop them to provide wider access uh, to India, Brazil, other countries, uh, and really bringing the cost down. And, and that's why I'm excited to be here today, but also to be working with Emilio. I think uh, it's not enough to develop it only for the US. If it's truly a breakthrough technology, we have to develop it for the world. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. So Gaurav, maybe your perspective from the clinical side. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Naveen. And I think Sharad has already covered a lot of territory, you know, uh, uh, so I don't really have much to add as far as that is concerned. Maybe I could just change the perspective around a bit uh, and tell it to you from here. Uh, basically, you know, we are a center which sees a very high volume of patients and we see them across the socioeconomic spectrum. And you might say that the kind of patients uh, that we see the spectrum sort of reflects Indian society. We have about 30, 20 to 30 percent of our patients are able to pay for their treatment, either from their pocket or reimbursement or insurance or employer, and about 70 percent are not able to pay. And this used to be the group which used to be like, you know, uh, a lot of them would abandon treatment because they would run out of resources, uh, uh, you know, halfway through, etc. And this is the problem which we faced in about, you know, 2013-14. We had put in place a very, very extensive support system by which we could support every child coming to us for treatment. Uh, so after that, the abandonment and everything fell down. But uh, we still found that after, you know, improving the outcomes to about 70%, uh, 20 to 25 percent would still be relapsing, as Charat had said, and we now see about 500 to 600 new cases of pediatric ALL alone in our center. That's below 15 years of age every year. So, if you do the math, that means that there's around 100 or children below 15 years of age in our center alone across the socioeconomic spectrum who who end up relapsing and require, you know, transplant as therapy. So, transplant is available. That's no that's a no brainer. Uh, we are, of course, you know, uh, transplant in country in this country was pioneered in our institution more than three and a half, four decades ago. Uh, we brought it uh, here and uh, we are one of the oldest transplant centers there. And we are a fairly high volume center. But even then, we find that out of the 8,200 children alone, and I'm not even going into the adult data because that's far more scarier, uh, are uh, eligible for some kind of transplant therapy. And uh, uh, actual real ground truth has been that uh, we have been transplanting less than three to five, maybe less than 10 of these children per year uh, in our center because our waiting is so huge. And that is reflective not just of our problem, it's a problem across the country. Uh, transplant centers are still, still too few to meet the need. Uh, so 
uh, you can do the math 70 to 80 percent maybe let's say 20 to 30 percent of them will do well on chemotherapy alone another 50 to 70 percent of those need transplant and only five to ten of them are making it to transplant because the wait list is a year and if we get them into remission they cannot last in remission for a year uh, so so we do send some to those who can we send them to another center around where they can have the transplant there uh, you know, but but many are just not able to make it. So it's a very very sad situation indeed. And if you multiply this with the projected uh, ALL uh, in the country and its outcomes uh, across the country, overall ALL outcomes are much more poorer if you take across the country than in individual centers of excellence. So so it's a far huge bigger more, more huge problem. And this is what we were faced with in 2014. Uh, we realized at that time that even if we improve our transplant capacity by three times, uh, four times. Uh, it's not going to make a dent in this, you know, this this uh, mm -hmm. huge uh, number of patients which we have. And that's mm -hmm. what sort of drove us into the CAR T space. At that time, mm -hmm. it was new, it was normal, it was coming out. It seemed like, you know, there were long-term remissions without uh, any, uh, without, you know, without transplant also, further transplant also. And the thought at that time was that if it's going to work so well, of course, we the, you know the more longer trials and longer outcomes are not there at that time, but we thought if it's going to work so well, can can we use this to sort of you know skip one jump? Uh, yeah. CAR T is being used in the U.S. as you know third or fourth line initially at that time, but but you know but we if our patients don't even make it to second line, and if somebody's facing uh, failing second line, there's really no third line. So yeah. so we really thought that we need to like you know uh, leapfrog ahead. And that's what drove us to get into this because every day I send 10 children home every week, every week I send about eight to 10 children home, you know, so it's, it's something which we just have to do something about. So that's yeah. an idea of the numbers and the burden that you face. Yeah. From us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that um, experience. Uh, Gaurav. So uh, Rahul, uh, uh, again, the question, we can move on to the next discussion. Um, you've been doing this uh, work for several years in India. Um, and uh, what are the I guess what are the challenges to to get something started like this in India and you know just you know the raw material standards and all that like CMC part is the focus of this discussion and that's where we want to get to this at the end but just your perspective your of of the start how you started and what challenges you faced initially <laughs> so many challenges Nareen. I know I know you know we've talked about yeah go ahead Yes. So um, if regarding CMC, as Bruce mentioned, there are multiple steps actually to manufacture the car T, right? And given our infrastructure, uh, like uh, uh, facility infrastructure, as well as even the reagents, raw material availability, sub uh, cold chain supply. So those are not excellent, uh, right? So those were the very big challenges to optimize the, all the assays and the manufacturing processes. So in the beginning, we spent a lot of time actually in developing the assays, developing the manufacturing processes. And in fact, first we were doing the research, uh, like X, Y, Y studies. Then we had to change the process to the GMP manufacturing process. So that was again another challenge. So we have faced a lot of CMC challenges, but uh, finally we are at a stage where we can uh, uh, manufacture the product in the GMP facility with the good process. Sorry, you break. You broke up, Rahul. Okay, uh, but by the time he comes back, uh, Rahul, I'll wait for one few seconds. Uh, Shashwati, maybe you can, you can take over if Rahul is coming back. Um, and maybe share your experiences in Iminil and, you know, from, from the startup perspective and... Yeah, uh, sure, Naren. I mean, I uh, echo some of the sentiments that Rahul mentioned. Um, clearly, uh, there is no cold chain logistics to ensure stability of uh, some of the raw materials that we require. Uh, it's there, but it is difficult to put in India is that there are no companies uh, which manufacture GMP grade LV, which is one of the starting materials for us. So uh, hopefully, you know, in India, there will be some companies cropping up which will manufacture the GMP grade LV uh, because right now we're looking outside the country and uh, some of the uh, better known CMOs and uh, the lead time to 
get even onto their waiting list is uh, quite a bit. Um, I mean, let alone the getting the uh, LV in hand. The other challenge that uh, we are facing is uh, the rules on import export permits to uh, import in these uh, LV, which is one of the critical starting material for any of the CAR T therapies. Now, one can imagine that uh, each time uh, we have a different product, we also have a different LV. And each time we have to import it from one of the CMOs, which is outside the country, we need to have a little bit more expedited process uh, in terms of getting those regulatory approvals done so that we can import it on time. Some patient is waiting for us to make their uh, drug and uh, infuse. So I just hope that the regulatory path to get those import permits and the export permits uh, is a little bit more streamlined. Uh, the other challenge that I would, yeah, yeah, let, let, Rahul's back. So maybe let Rahul continue and then I'll, I'll ask you to uh, talk about regulatory. Yes. Yeah, Rahul, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Yeah. So in the beginning, as I was mentioning, CMC challenges were huge. But finally, we could manufacture good quality cells in the GMP facility with good process consistency. And now we have uh, all the uh, QC assays. In fact, Bruce had a big list of long list of quality control. And it was, again, a difficult task to develop and standardize each assay uh, multiple time uh, in a good uh, GLP environment. But now we have all those assays working. And uh, so all those things are in place. It took us a lot of time. It was not like a... I think he's having some trouble. I think it took him, I think, six, seven years. <laughs> That's what he told me. So it was quite a long time. So, so Rahul, I know you're having some challenges. Um, Shashwati, my question to you was mainly um, uh, from a regulatory perspective in India. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? You you touched upon the import-export, but but also you know, what it does, what does it take to get the clinical trial started? And so Rahul, uh, sorry, you, you can finish your statement. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow my internet is dropping today. I don't know why. Uh, so maybe you yeah. can uh, keep your video off. Then I think it will be better. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so QC is now also, we have optimized and developed each assays <coughs> as per the, all the guidelines. So it took us time, but we are there now. Uh, so CMC things we have figured it out. It took us a long time. And now we are actually looking forward to the trial. So we have we are going through the regulatory aspects of the trial now. Yeah. Okay. So that, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Shashwati, my question to you was mainly for reg, um, for regulatory. And, and maybe you can touch it. Just give a broad overview of um, regulatory and the challenges that you face. Yeah, so uh, I think the regulatory path that is currently present in our country is mainly focused on small molecules, biologics, vaccines, wherein, uh, you know, it is made in huge quantity and then the drug is distributed to many patients. Uh, and plus it is uh, not product specific like in this case. So today we may have a CD20 car, tomorrow we will have CD19 car, uh, again, BCMA car and so on and so forth. So um, given that the... the even to get to the preclinical state, there are a lot of forms that needs to be filled and approved. And few of the things are probably not relevant in our field of CAR T because we don't have the preclinical animal models which are suitable to even test out something for toxicity. So, how do we test something uh, in a mouse model, for example, if uh, the product is specific for a human? Um, some challenges. Uh, okay, um, so why don't we move to um, the next topic that I wanted to cover? So we did we did clinical initially. We talked a little bit about the you know CMC and regulatory challenges. We'll come to raw materials yeah. in detail in a minute. But but maybe for you can tell us a little bit about spe I mean in, in raw materials, but specifically lentiviral vectors because as Shashwati mentioned, you know access to lentiviral vectors in India is extremely difficult. Yeah, so thank you, Narin. So maybe before I go to the lentiviral vector, I think um, to, to the comment made earlier, contrast in small molecule world to large biologics and, and advanced therapies, 
I think we need to think of this type of therapies like as a construct and you have multiple components. And uh, I can see the challenge from uh, a development standpoint, but also from a regulatory uh, standpoint, if a regulator is constantly evaluating a dossier where uh, you have to look at the product itself, but also the different component. So I think I can imagine if, if you have the right platforms and collaborative effort to make sure that uh, everyone is using the same quality um, vector, uh, beats, um, cell culture media, all of that, I think we'll be a, in a better spot. You can you can develop different type of therapies. You can target different um, you know uh, genes, but I think the, the 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 common denominator are the raw materials. So addressing those as a as a construct actually is very uh, important. Um, you know, collaborative effort between regulators and and, and developers. So uh, for for lentiviral vector, there are two aspects, and I agree that the. The challenge with having enough actually viral vectors to produce those therapies is a problem. I think there's a lot of excitement when this uh, CAR T uh, product were first approved. I think we're we're facing now like uh, it, there is not enough maybe high quality viral vectors, and and that can be addressed by uh, you know having the right um, contract manufacturing uh, organization and and collaborating with developers. This is something that, that I think it is really critical. Um, so, so that's maybe for um, increasing capacity of manufacturing of viral vectors. But then uh, using the vector themselves and uh, ensuring that um, safety um, concerns have been addressed is really um, important because we all know that um, you know, our regulatory agencies actually rightly require um, integration studies and long-term follow-up on, on product um, using lentiviral vector, for example. And because this type of vectors have the potential to integrate permanently into the host cells and to persist for a long term. So uh, that's why um, there are you know, requirements by different agencies, uh, such as the European Medicine Agency, but also um, the, the FDA uh, has, for example, that the, the vector the, the recommends that the integration copy number uh, shall be uh, less than five copies per genome. Uh, there is also a, a, a reflection uh, paper by the European Medicine Agency, which talks about the, 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 the issues with integrated vector copies per genome and, and the need actually to control that as well as the integration profile and integration site. Um, so, so the one thing I mentioned in my presentation, I'm happy to elaborate a little bit more but one way to, to address that the vector, the, the integration is to have um, to use uh, standardized assays, which also require uh, the right type of reference material, because uh, today the methods that are used for integration um, studies, uh, such as the amplification mediated uh, PCR or high throughput sequencing, have still some uh, limitation in terms of sensitivity, accurate quantification, and data interpretation. And, and there's a need actually to have a uh, different type of orthogonal method, you know, different version of PCR like uh, qPCR, digital PCR, and, 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 and sequencing studies to be run in an orthogonal manner to confirm actually, the, 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 um, to estimate accurately the number of copies that have integrated in the genome. Um, I, I don't want to maybe use um, all the time. I'm happy to talk about the approach we are taking about how we want to develop a standard for vector copy number, but I'll pause here for now uh, to see if this addresses the, the question or if anybody has um, a, a different perspective. Yeah, so any questions uh, for the panelists for either Shashwati, Rahul, or uh, from further? Uh, yes, uh, sure. uh, hi this is Shashwati. Um, you see, when you're developing the assay, uh, you are choosing a, uh, a part of the lentiviral uh, genome, which is going to be common across different vectors. It's not going to be vector specific, right? Like tomorrow, if we change the lentiviral vector, we can still use the standard. Um, I, I, absolutely. I, I think the purpose, of, the purpose of this is to have a sort of like a generic type of assay and standard. I think there is a very good uh, paper published by Yuan um, Zhao and Christian Schneider from NIBSC a few years ago 
uh, that details actually, um, you know, strategies for developing uh, reference standards, I think, and those could be, you know, uh, taken by uh, developers themselves, but the work is so, is huge actually, that probably it makes sense for an organization like USP or the NIBSC WHO to develop that standard. But the, the simple way to put it is, uh, you, you can take different cell types. We, we looked at 293 cells, but also JERCAT, and we're looking at the third cell type, and it may end actually yielding the same type of standard. You take those cells and you transduce them with a lentiviral vector uh, with, with um, you know, some like GFP or any type of like um, irrelevant uh, gene to just ensure actually expression, something that can be used to selection. Once you tr transduce that, you take the cells and you start your selection and cloning. So and then you clone actually um, uh, cells based on the number of um, integrated, um, you know, um, viral vector into the genome of the cells. And then you select um, a panel. In our case, we're targeting uh, zero, one, two, and five. It may end up sometimes when you quantify, it may end up not being exactly two, it may be 2.5 or something like that. That's what we're trying to do right now. But the goal is really to have a panel that goes from a control where there's no integration to a low, medium, high. And, and once you have those clones, I think, and you have the cells, you can culture, you can expand the cells and, and extract the DNA. And now you have genomic DNA that you can use as a panel of reference standard, which can be used to generate a standard curve. It can be used for the calibration of assays. And it's really, it doesn't really matter what type of, of, of uh, construct you have, as long as it's that lentiviral vector. I think that's one of the advantages where, where I, I'll be honest with you, I think, I, I don't have an answer to the question, how would uh, genomic DNA extracted from 293 cells differ from the one from JERCAT? I think that's something we will now, as we advance with the studies, different groups actually are uh, pursuing this strategy as well. Yeah. So, so, okay, good, great. Uh, so let, let me just move to a sort of different topic and I'll ask first Bruce to talk about it, then Madhavi, maybe I'm going to ask you this question. So Bruce, one of the things that I'm very, um, you know, it's, it's apparent when you come to a facility like yours in Penn, that there's an extreme tight-knit collaboration with translation sciences, right? You have all your professors and your postdoctoral students and your, you know, and you 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 gave me the opportunity to teach this course last week in UPenn, and I realized you know that that close knit between academia and industry has really flourished in Penn. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? And then Madhavi, maybe you can comment, or maybe others can also comment as to is that something that's lacking in India? Well, well first, yeah. Th thanks, Naren. Uh, let me just say first uh, uh, to put things in perspective. Uh, I started the lab at the Navy in late 1994, and we treated our first patient in 1996, non-gene modified. Uh, so then CAR patients in 2010. That was a 14, 15 year time span. Uh, so it does take some time to build programs uh, and what we started with was a very efficient way to grow T cells. And once we had demonstrated that in clinical trials, we were approached by industry, by cell genesis. We did the first collaborations uh, with them on CAR T cell clinical trials. And then it became other companies. So uh, lentivirus, uh, the first use of lentivirus in humans, uh, Varixis approached us and then Sangamo with zinc finger nucleases. So as you build capability, then you build collaborators with industry. And so that was a series of collaborations with relatively small biotech. And so we treated three patients with CART-19 cells in 2010, published in 2011. Uh, when those results were published and covered, and between 1.5 and 2.5 kilograms of leukemia was obliterated over several weeks. The university was approached by entities of all sizes to license the technology from one person with a lot of money all the way up to Novartis. So we had no idea a big pharma would be interested in gene therapy, but they actually had some prior collaborations. 
And so we, what I'm getting to is we learned along the way. And as you learn along the way, you build collaborators, you build an academic program, you have diversified funding, uh, not only from federal grants, but also philanthropy and then the industry collaborations. And yeah. So that's how we get to today. Uh, before turning over, just add one quick comment about lentiviruses, which is the production is getting better. Uh, the titers are getting better. There are suspension lines, the costs are coming down. Uh, so I'm optimistic on that point as well as viral vector free gene transfer. And we can come back to that later. Okay. Uh, so Madhavi, the question, follow up question for you for that is, uh, from a government perspective, um, what are the, in addition to funding organizations like, you know, uh, the IIT and Imineel and others for, for specific CAR T cell manufacturing, um, are you also funding basic research scientists to do discovery work on um, this, uh, this field of immune oncology? And maybe you can speak in general about uh, funding and government initiatives. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, so I will just briefly describe, as you said, about the overall funding that uh, BIREC and DBT uh, is, uh, you know, is uh, doing in this sector. So I think we have, uh, I'm uh, listening to the discussions, I think Dr. Shashwati earlier said that, uh, you know, lentiviral vector manufacturing capability of the raw materials is a huge, huge gap. So that was one thing which we, uh, which Bayrek, uh, uh, while discussing with the eminent experts here, I think Dr. Rahul and Dr. Narula and people from, uh, you know, the, the initial brainstorming session that we had, uh, that Bayrek and DBT had as Dr. Mera Malka Sharma was mentioning earlier. So these were the things and challenges which came up then. And based on that, the uh, requests for proposals were designed and uh, all these brainstorming sessions uh, were, uh, that led into those uh, RFPs and uh, the fundings were uh, given out or are being uh, uh, doled out. So the lentiviral vector manufacturing facility is one of them uh, that is to address the diet need. And it was very heartening to know from these speakers, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that about 500 lakhs uh, is to be given to import a lentiviral vial with, with a small vial, which is just sufficient for 50 ml of this uh, you know, uh, volume, which is just enough for few number of patients. So that is the need, uh, that is uh, the mission or biopharma mission is trying to fulfill or uh, the address the gap. And as far as the early discovery is concerned, I think DBT is pitching in there. Uh, the projects the DBT is supporting are apart from the anti-CD19, which are the validated targets, but the other targets like uh, CD20 and other targets, which they are, I mean, the DBT is, uh, the government is supporting. So it's just not the uh, validated targets, but the newer targets as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, uh, we are almost 40 minutes into the presentation and we've covered a little bit of clinical over overview. We covered a little bit about CMC and, and what, what it takes to start up CAR T cells in India. Uh, Shashwati, talked, Shashwati talked a little bit about uh, regulatory and then um, Fur talked about the um, standards. And then finally, Bruce, Bruce uh, spoke a little bit about collaboration between academia and uh, industry. So let me just open it up for the next 10 minutes or so for any questions that the panel may have for each other. Uh, so, yeah, Gaurav, uh, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think, you know, very interesting point when you asked Bruce about the environment in the US and, you know, you covered the industry uh, academia kind of uh, nexus and how government academia, which Dr. Madhvi covered so nicely. Uh, and uh, but, but you know the one thing which get, got left out is uh, a big gap which we have in India as compared to the U.S. system where you have a lot of MD PhDs. Uh, here we have MDs and we have PhDs. Uh, so you know uh, uh, the problem here is that uh, in a complex uh, say, technology like CAR T cell, uh, the MDs and PhDs really have to get together. So uh, that's something, you know, you've got to know the, uh, the MDs planning to lead CAR-T trials need to know as much about the car uh, as the person making it. They need to know everything about it. And the, and the people making the car need to know a lot about what's going to happen in the patient because, you know, uh, in India, we work in silos. Uh, it's very, very difficult to, you know, bridge that gap and come together. Whereas in the U.S., uh, probably scientists investigate, investigate 
Yeah. So, so Gaurav or, or anybody else, maybe you can talk and uh, Bruce had touched upon this in his presentation about training. And maybe you can start with four because, you know, the USP has a uh, also initiative on training. Uh, mm -hmm. And then maybe we can go around the room and t touch upon this very important point that you brought up, Gaurav. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so maybe I can uh, just uh, share my thoughts. Sorry, I'll just conclude that. By go ahead, sure. At, I, yeah, at the end of it, that uh, though, uh, you know, uh, I cannot make a car tea uh, like Rahul can, and Rahul still cannot treat a patient like I can, obviously. But I think short of that, we know as much about each other's jobs uh, as is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. go ahead, and then we'll ask for to give a little bit of training. Yeah, no, uh, I Correct. So I completely agree with uh, Dr. Gaurav here that uh, we need more of interaction between clinicians, the MDs, and the researchers, that is the PhD. Here in India, and put it in uh, several, uh, you know, uh, examples. Where in translational research is something that will probably uh, maybe Shashadi try to close your video. Maybe you'll have better because you were dropping. Yeah, Sh Shashadi actually texted me saying that. Um, Preclinical model development in India is very poor. Right from academics. Am I audible now? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, without the video, much better. It seems. Go ahead. Shashwati. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that uh, Shashwati, we'll let you speak when you come back. Um, so, for maybe you can talk about um, uh, training. And the, you know what? What kind of forums um, USP does? Fad, you are mute. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I think the. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So I, I was just going to talk about. The, the training. I think we, we, we have a number of courses and we are developing, we developed like a, a couple of formal trainings to cover other areas, including vaccines and biotech product. In the area of advanced therapies, we, we recently um, were uh, endorsed to be a center of excellence um, for advanced therapies within the Asia Pacific economies that doesn't cover India, but I think some of the program there can be also expanded and, and extended to, to India if needed, we can, we can really discuss. As a matter of fact, this week we just launched that training program. And, and part of that is, is to uh, start really by going through a component uh, in manufacturing, raw materials, then supply chain, then to uh, testing quality attribute potency, for example. So right now we are at step one, looking at the raw material. And I think as we go to the next training workshop, we may cover those um, other areas. But uh, the goal for any of this and for the, 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 the training we just launched for raw material, for example, is to make sure that um, the, the, the stakeholders have um, a common understanding uh, of the issues around raw materials. I think there are a lot of um, you know, misunderstanding about the GMP versus the non-GMP, but also the need to have a consistency from lot to lot when you're using raw materials. I think we tend to think that raw material is just like the material you add to your manufacturing. It's probably as critical as the, the finished product itself in, in this case. Um, the, 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 the goal of the training also should be to help the, 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 the trainee actually understand how they can select and characterize a material that they will use actually in their manufacturing. And, and, and there are a lot of actually guidelines and guidance documents out there. I think it's a matter of just supporting the, 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 the trainees actually understanding how they can implement national and international standards. And, and additionally, uh, you know, part of the training is to learn how you mitigate supply chain and quality risk throughout the product life cycle. I think you may start actually your production and development with, a, uh, for example, a raw material and down the road actually, you know, your supplier changes something on you. That's the kind of thing you need to think about in advance so training uh, should actually cover that. And that's some of the, the things we cover in, in, in the training we, we provide. Also making sure that everyone learns actually from real world case studies in, in cell gene therapy. I think today, I think I'm, you know, when I look at uh, the, the slides that Bruce presented, I can see a couple of uh, 
you know, areas that are uh, tested actually um, in the final formulation. But those are like things that uh, quality need to be ensured before actually you get to manufacturing. For example, the beads, you know, we talked about the, the, the viral vector, but all the components that are used in producing that viral vector also are, uh, are need to be addressed. So, so I think we do have things in place and things under development. And again, uh, I'm happy to share as we go the, the program that we just launched in the APEC region and we can look at what, what is needed in India and we can work with you on, on, on launching a, a similar training. Great, thank you. Um, Shashwati, I know you're back. Um, and so maybe you can speak and then I wanted Bruce to maybe talk a little bit about the International Society and what the International Society does worldwide for training. So Shashwati first and then Bruce. Okay, thank you, Nareen. So the point I was trying to highlight is the uh, lack of a proper in vivo preclinical animal model for uh, doing toxicity studies in a preclinical setup. Now, expectation from the regulatory on any kind of therapy is that we should provide data on toxicity. And uh, that becomes a little bit of a hurdle because uh, CAR-T therapy uh, essentially happens in immunocompromised mouse models. And uh, because of the lack of species specificity, we really can't study toxicity in any kind of animal, uh, preclinical animal models. So, uh, I mean, that is something that I feel that either we need to have improved preclinical models where we can have translationally relevant information. If not, I feel that, you know, some kind of a leeway should be given in terms of the regulatory path when we're trying to uh, get some of those approvals because it is a very, very autologous nature and it is very human specific. Yeah, good point. Uh, so Bruce, maybe yeah, we you can talk can about this. Yeah. yeah, and we'll come back to the, the preclinical work again, uh, because I want to ask Madhavi also that question. Uh, Bruce, uh, the International Society. Yeah, I, I want to make uh, a couple points. Uh, uh, and the theme is education, training, and expertise integration. At Penn, we have research labs, we have a product and process development lab, we have a manufacturing facility, quality control testing, quality assurance, the clinical expertise and the correlative studies. It really is a, a mini biotech embedded within academia uh, and it's facilitated the very rapid translation of complex technologies and evaluation and clinical trials. Now, Another example of how you get there is, uh, as Aaron mentioned, the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy. This is a global society composed of three pillars, the scientific pillar, the quality operations and regulatory pillar, and the commercialization pillar. And you can't have one without the other to develop this technology. And and you know, we're past the point of silos. Uh, you need the scientific development to be able to commercialize. If you do scientific development, but it doesn't go anywhere, how is it benefiting patients? And you need that regulatory and, and quality oversight to be able to facilitate that. So I joined ICT in 2000 and 1999. There's no society that has had as much an impact on development of my career and I think facilitated development of cell and gene therapy programs. Uh, and since last year we're virtual, this year in May, end of May we're virtual, it's enabled uh, attendees from India and, and other parts of the world that maybe wouldn't have been able to go to Paris. Uh, so uh, look at the program, uh, happy to talk to anyone online or offline about ICT and how we facilitated the program at Penn. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so Madhavi, uh, if you can speak a little bit about um, the government's, again, initiative for uh, training and um, things like that, because we also, we also have the, you know, the, we have an entire institute for translation research, right? <laughs> so maybe you can speak a little bit of that. So, uh, yes, so Bi Biopharma Mission, uh, which I am part of, uh, Birex Biopharma Mission. So, training and skill development is an important mandate, an important part of the mission. 
and uh, so in we have like different categories uh, for that in medical devices in biotherapeutics in gmp uh, regulatory aspects like gmp gcp trainings so gcp trainings are ongoing we had uh, done a series of gcp trainings uh, similarly we had done series of trainings on uh, uh, medical the regulatory aspects as well but uh, since this is a new area so as I understand that uh, there are lack of preclinical animal models and uh, uh, even challenges in uh, you know orthogonal assays for uh, determination of the vector copy number. So we have uh, another series of trainings coming up, which would be in the biotherapeutic sector that is in plan. So I think this is a takeaway for me also. So some of these could be integrated into that training. Uh, but we would be looking for uh, people who could provide that training nationally or internationally. So that's where uh, we would need inputs maybe to design that kind of a training. But yes, training is uh, as a big one of the mandates of the mission. Great, thank you. Uh, Sharath, I know you've been silent for a while. Uh, I'll let you uh, just sort of comment on all the commentary that we've had so far. And in the last five minutes, uh, we'll do a little bit of a uh, exercise on uh, on an Excel spreadsheet. But Sharad, uh, last word for you for the panel discussion. <laughs> yeah, whatever I've heard, very, very encouraging. And clearly, I think the training part is a, is a key point. Uh, and clearly getting some of the clinicians also involved with some of this work uh, is, is very important uh, for better understanding and uh, collaboration between, you know, uh, the, the lab side and, and also on the clinical side. And clearly, I think any of the training programs, which I think Dr. Mr. Dr. Bruce also alluded to, would be very useful for a subset of people who are kind of looking to cross over to the other side and also work in that area. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so what I'm going to indulge in a little bit is a little bit of, in the last five minutes, ask you to help me with some words. That's almost like keywords, and I'm going to share my desktop. Screen. And this is going to be a blank Excel spreadsheet. Can you can you see my Excel? I, th I think you can see it, right? You can you can see my desktop. Yes. Good. Okay. So what I'm going to ask all of you to do, and and we can go uh, one by one uh, in a in a row, and I'll just say uh, I'll just call out your names. You, see, you all you have to say is you have to say one word, uh, and then uh, so let's go, uh, Bruce. I, uh, okay, uh, give you a little context. Um, one word on the conversation we had today, you know, whether it is clinical challenges or whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick a different type of word, which is marathon. Uh, so this is challenging. Uh, it's a long race. Uh, and you're actually not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the patients. And once you complete yeah. one marathon, it feels good and you want to do it again. <laughs> it's addicting also, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Fern? I, I would say um, CMC uh, learning from biotech. There are a lot of lessons there. Yeah. Shashwati? Uh, I would say accessibility and uh, better interaction or more interaction with our regulators. Mm. Madhavi? I would say skilled manpower oh, is very much required in the sector. Um, Gaurav. Uh, I'm so it's on my phone, so I'll and you know you'll have to read out the words. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it says marathon, CMC, biotech, access, skill, power. Anyway, whatever comes to your mind. Ah, yeah, so uh, definitely. Uh, I, I think regulatory, uh, but an uh, area which we didn't touch upon, and that is not just the regulatory aspects of, uh, you know, uh, the making the process of the CAR T, but actually the CAR T clinical trials, uh, how they should be designed. Yes, that's, that's something which we really need to talk about. You know? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, Rahul? Yeah, I was just thinking that in India, you know, that we are not just making cars, we are making the road as well. So, <laughs> right? And so that's what I have been doing in the last uh, eight, seven years now. Making the road, yeah. not just cars. Yeah, absolutely wonderful thought. Uh, Sharath? Yeah, I would just say need and affordability. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll, put, I'll make them as soon. And I will say um, collaboration. Uh, let's do one more round. Uh, I, has everyone done, have done? Maybe Anu and uh, I know you're listening in. Why don't you say one word at least? Ranjan, first Ranjan and then Anu. Yeah, I would, I would say supply chain. And uh, Ranjan? Yeah, I think you put it there already, uh, the raw material. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's do one more round and we'll go the same. We'll try. I'll see if I can get the same order. Bruce, again? Uh, has everyone been done? Everyone's done, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, I'll pick, I'll pick one that I talked about, which is variability. Uh, and, you know, with small molecules, you can define them. There's even defined fetal calf serum. But with cells, even allergen egg cells, cell lines, there is variability. And it's a learning process, learning yeah. how to deal with that, how to characterize it. Yeah. Uh, for just maybe. I'd say uh, shared resources. Yeah, excellent. Gaurav? Yeah, so uh, actually, you know, it's collaboration uh, because that's, uh, we, we really need, there's a big, big demand supply gap, which we need to bridge very fast. Yeah. Uh, Shara? i just like to bring in training. Training is equally important. Yeah. Shashwati? I would say uh, validated assays to ensure very high quality of the product. No compromise on safety, purity, and identity. Yeah. Um, Anu? Yeah, I would say quality and consistency. Uh, Anjan? Hmm. Hey, um, I, I think most of it is maybe some innovation, some more innovation in essays. Yeah. Ranjan, if you're on, otherwise. Standards. Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, I, I just thought uh, the uh, clarity on the clinical trials, because I think that's a big gap here. Uh, no, I'm going to stop sharing and thank you for indulging. Anu, uh, I think we are over, up with time, so maybe you can sort of summarize and finish the session for us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Narain. Just one thing to add in there is a standardization. I think that's, again, an important aspect. Yeah, I'll share the spreadsheet with you, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. I would just like to thank Dr. Narain uh, for making this session so interactive and lively. Uh, we got some very good points uh, of discussion, which we will be compiling and sharing it with you all. Uh, we talked about various aspects from raw material to supply chain, regulatory aspects, import, export, CMC, whatnot. So I think we covered touch based upon a lot many things. And uh, I think as mentioned by Fuad, we USP is investing in this area and we look forward to continue the discussion further and uh, would like to take this, you know, in collaboration, would like to take this journey forward. So uh, again, on behalf of USP, I would just like to thank you all for joining us today and providing such, you know, valuable insights into this area. Uh, thank you. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Madhvi for the closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Anu, and uh, thank you, U.S. Pharmacopoeia team, for this excellent session, and uh, thank you, Dr. Narendra Chilbule, for coordinating it. And uh, as Dr. Anu said, it was a very lively, in interactive session, and uh, really enjoyed it. And thank you, all the eminent experts, uh, and on behalf of DBT and Bireg, I thank you all for to be part of this session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. And we are very much.